All right. Hey. All right, let's get started. Please have a seat. So today's lecture will be about the attention mechanism and the transformer architecture. And three quarters of the lecture, we will have Ivona lecturing. She's a PhD student at the Institute for Informatics and doing some really great works and is an expert on all of this stuff. So she will be giving this part of the lecture. And afterwards, the last quarter of it, I will be talking about uh, transformers for computer vision. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Ivona. Some of you maybe know me from the TA sessions. Uh, I'm one of your TAs. And today I will talk about attention mechanism and transformers. Um, okay, let's get started. Um, okay, this is not, if I go, should I click something here because mm. And I cannot see my cursor. That is interesting. <laughs> see it, what happened? Something frozen? <laughs> I don't know. Now if it's it... It's frozen maybe? No. Oh, okay. It's, no? I think it might be frozen, yeah. Wait, should I... Oh, that's why. Oh, maybe, maybe because it was actually connected on Bluetooth. I see. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Now? Yeah, it works yes. now. Okay. Okay, so uh, first let's see the overview of today's lecture. Uh, we'll start by talking about sequence to sequence models. Um, then I will talk about sequence to sequence models, how they're used in uh, neural machine translation. So if you're familiar with, uh, if you had NLP course, you might be familiar with sequence to sequence. Otherwise, I will briefly explain you what it is. Uh, then we're going to talk about what is the issue of sequence to sequence uh, models that actually led to uh, introducing the attention mechanism. We also have a slight variant of attention, which is called self-attention. Then how these blocks are used to build the transformer. Then we'll talk about language transformers, multimodal transformers, and then Yuki will take over about the vision transformer. Okay, so sequence-to-sequence -sequence models are basically encoder-decoder architectures, which consist of two parts. So encoder, which takes a variable length sequence of elements. In this case, it can be anything as input. And it transforms this sequence into a context representation with a fixed size. Then the decoder, this part, takes this context representation and transforms it into a variable sequence of elements. So basically mapping one sequence of elements to another sequence of elements through this uh, fixed context representation. We can also see how that looks like with this animation. So we have the context vector produced by an encoder which is used as input in the decoder to produce the, um, the output of this model. So this kind of encoder-decoder structure had huge success in many tasks like machine translation, text summarization, image captioning, and so on. Uh, we're going to take machine translation, which is basically translating of sentences, let's say from French to English, as an example. Um, so neural machine translation, 
with a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model. So here, the encoder neural network basically reads the source sentence into a fixed -like context vector, and then the decoder outputs a translation of this context vector. Um, so here we have an example of French sentence, uh, Je suis étudiant, uh, taken as input in the decoder. It produces the uh, context representation that we saw here, this one, and then the decoder basically translates word by word this French sentence into English. So this is how translation works. Yeah, you have a question? Okay. I'm new to these things. Okay, now? Is it better? Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, okay, next. Um, so in this sequence-to-sequence -sequence models for neural machine translation, the encoder basically uh, takes the sequence of these vectors, x1, x2, those are the words, um, and they map that into a context vector. So the encoder in neural machine translation can be a simple RNN, which is like a recurrent neural network, or LSTM. So the choice of this encoder part is not that important. The important part is that you know that uh, it produces a context vector, which is encoding this input sentence. Um, so we have something that we call hidden states here uh, for each time step, so basically for each word, HT, which is a nonlinear function which takes as input the current word and the previous hidden state in order to produce the next hidden state. And the context is basically also defined as a nonlinear uh, function, which basically takes uh, all hidden states uh, of the encoder. Um, the decoder can also be a recurrent neural network or an LSTM, and basically it's trained to predict the next word, so to translate the next word, given this context vector C, which was produced by the encoder, and all previously predicted words. So we have here the words that are generated are denoted as Y1 until the end of the sentence. Um, in terms of how this works under the hood, so it defines probability distribution over the translation by decomposing the joint probability into conditionals. So we have something like, like this. What is the probability of generating the sentence Y? Well, we can tokenize that into words, so the probability of generating a word at a given time step t, given all previously generated words, and this context vector, which is of fixed length. Um, so if we have an Ireland dec uh, decoder, each of these conditional probabilities will be represented like this, so with some, again, nonlinear function, where we also take into account the hidden state of the decoder. So we have this notion of hidden states both of the encoder and of the decoder. Um, but there is an issue of this sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. Um, maybe you notice that I mentioned a few times that this context vector has a fixed length. So if we take a look at this figure again, so you see the encoder is basically encoding the input sequence into something that has fixed length, this uh, orange block here, the context vector. And that is always taken into account when generating the output sentence. So the issue is that it has fixed lengths. And basically that's seen as a bottleneck of these sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. Um, so the context, you can think about it as a, basically as a vector representation of floats, and it has some size, which is usually the, which is the hidden unit in the encoder RNN. So basically, the challenge is that it's really difficult for a model to compress a lot of information into just a fixed length context vector, especially if we deal with long sequences. So in the examples that we had before with the translation, so this is a short sentence, je suis étudiant, like we have three words, but this is not always the case. Sometimes we'll have a whole paragraph, sometimes even more, right? So compressing all that information into something that has fixed size it's difficult, um, so it's really challenging, and then the performance really degrades here. So how to tackle this issue? Well, basically, the answer is attention. Attention is a mechanism which basically allows this sequence to sequence. Yeah. Uh, sorry, a question about the context vector. Yeah. Um, is, uh, what, what's the difference between a context vector here and a latent space? Or a, 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 you can 
Yeah, you can think about it as the latent space. So, yeah, yeah, basically that's the latent space in between the encoder and the decoder. Um, okay, so this issue is basically uh, overcome by the introduction of the attention mechanism. Um, so, first let's talk about the intuition of, of attention and why it's so, so good. So basically, this allows the model to focus on relevant parts of the input while decoding the output. So for example, not the whole uh, source sentence is not important for decoding the output. Some words or some elements in the sequence might be more important than others when we want to generate something from the decoder. So basically, this attention mechanism, what is the idea? Basically, we are allowing the model to focus on relevant parts of the input. So not to compress just information in one fixed vector, but to have adaptively, adaptively to focus on relevant parts of the input. So in the context of machine translation, basically translation of sentences, this means that each time when the model generates a translation of a word, it searches in the uh, source sentence for a position where the most relevant information is concentrated for translating a given word. Um, so basically attention is a really breakthrough idea in NLP and some say that it is as impactful as convolutional neural networks were in computer vision. So that's a big thing. And it was introduced in this paper, Neural Machine Translation by Learning to Align and Translate, which I really highly recommend that you take a look at this paper. It's really nicely written. Um, Okay, so now let's see how attention works, how, like where does it find its place in encoder-decoder architectures. So if we have attention, we don't need anymore to encode the whole input into single fixed length vector, because that was the, the problem, as we said. Instead, we can encode the input into sequences of vectors, basically sequences of hidden states, and then to, we can choose a subset of those vectors, which are important for decoding the output. And basically this frees the model from having to squeeze all information from the source sequence into a fixed length vector. So we can take a look at here what happens. So we are basically taking word by word uh, the input, encoding by the encoder RNN. And then we keep all hidden states. And then when the decoder is, okay, this part is here cropped somehow, but it doesn't matter. Um, so when the, uh, so we, we don't compress the inputs anymore into just one size vector, but we keep all the hidden states and then we learn which ones are important more and which ones are not that important. So basically we learn where to pay attention, hence the name attention. Um, now let's formally define attention. So basically we're using the equations from before and we'll see where this context vector will be changed. Uh, so if you remember, we defined the decoder as a nonlinear function, which takes basically the previously generated word, y t minus one, the hidden state of the uh, decoder RNN, and the context vector. But now for the context vector here with attention, we have the index notation. So now we are keeping basically all hidden states instead of just one fixed sized uh, vector. So basically now this probability is conditioned on this distinct context vector each time for each target uh, token Y, unlike in conventional encoder decoder models. Um, basically now this context vector, CI, will depend of, on the sequence of annotations, we will see what this annotation means, to which the encoder maps the input sen uh, sentence. Um, and each annotation basically is now, we can think about it as a hidden state of the encoder. It contains information about the whole input, but with a strong focus on the parts that surround the, the given word in the input sequence. So H is basically uh, the output of the encoder RNN. Um, okay, so um, I mentioned briefly about the intuition that is like learning what is more important and what is less important in the input uh, sequences. So basically, um, that can also be seen in a definition, at the formal definition of attention. So this context vector is no more, no less, but a weighted sum of these annotations. So we need to learn these weights, basically which hidden states are more important than others. 
so importance weights. Um, yeah, so the contact vector, as you can see here, is just a weighted sum. Uh, we are learning the coefficients alpha, which are putting weights on these hidden states. Um, yeah, if you take a look at this equation, maybe some of you can recognize that it's a softmax, basically. Um, and what happens here in this equation? Well, we have something that is called alignment model, which is just a simple feedforward neural network, which takes as input the hidden states of the decoder and the hidden states of the encoder. And basically the idea is to score how well these uh, inputs around the position J of the input and the output at the position I match. So basically how, how well they match and then uh, it's jointly trained with the other components of the model. So I'm talking about this feedforward neural net that is jointly trained with the encoder neural network and the decoder neural network. So it's just one feedforward neural network which acts as alignment model. Basically, it helps us to learn these weights. Um, we can take a look also at this figure. Uh, it might become more clear. And this figure is basically from the paper that introduces attention, so it's pretty, uh, once again, I recommend that you take a look at it. Um, so we have the input here, x1, x2, up to xt. So those are, we can think of the, them as, of, as words of a sentence. We have this part here. It's, um, they use bidirectional RNN, which means they process the uh, sentence from both sides, from left and right. So that's why we have two uh, annotations, H1, when you process the sentence from the left and from the right, and they're basically concatenated, so that's just like a small detail. And basically, we learn these weights here, these alphas that I showed you also in the previous slide, which uh, tell the decoder, this is the decoder which outputs the words, so this is the translation, yt minus one, yt, this is at a given time step of the translation of the sentence, and basically, when we want to translate a given word yt, we also take into account these weights. So which of these positions from the source sentence is important when we want to produce the next word? Uh, I will show you also an example. What does that mean? Like you will see, I think you will understand clear, more clearly. Um, so once again, these weights here, alpha, ij, basically reflect the importance of this annotations of these encoded states with respect to the previous hidden states of the decoder when deciding what is the next step, basically helping us to generate the word, which is next. So this implements uh, attention in the decoder. And decoder intuitively decides which parts of the source sentence it should pay more attention to. And then, uh, again, why attention? Well, because as you can see now, the encoder doesn't have the burden to squeeze all information into something that has fixed length, but it can uh, selectively choose on which hidden state to pay more attention. So let's see this uh, example. So again, the same sentence, the sweet adjunct, to translate it into English. So the translation is, I am a student. So you can see that these words are basically encoded in these hidden states, and then uh, the translation starts. So to translate the word je, it is important to look at the, this word i. Okay, so that's clear. But then when translating sui, the model can, should pay also attention to this position, but also to this position. So you see, i am m a, it's important to, um, so when you're translating the word three, it's important to focus on these two positions. So not, it's not like one-on-one -on -one translation anymore, right? And then for it to the end, uh, it's important to also take into account a student. So this is maybe a simple example. We have also something more complex here. So on this axis, uh, we have the French sentence, which should be translated. And here is the English translation. So you can see that we don't have always one-on-one -on -one dependence between the tokens. So in French we say uh, la zone économique européenne, but in English it's the European economic area. So the word zone, zone 
in French comes first, but in the English transla translation is after the economic, uh, the European economic area. So it's not one-on-one -on -one, uh, correspondence between these tokens. And basically, attention mechanism allows us to model this kind of phenomena. So when translating um, pen, let's say, it learns to pay attention selectively, not on the corresponding position, but it can learn, it can learn to see further. Right, so that's the interesting part. We also have something which is called self-attention. So until now, maybe you noticed I was talking about communicating between the encoder and the decoder with this attention mechanism. But also we have something self-attention, which is called self-attention, which basically is relating parts of the sequence with each other. So that's in the encoder. So not between the encoder and decoder, that's called inter-attention. We have something self-attention or intra-attention, which is basically uh, the encoder or the decoder. Uh, they use attention within the module. Um, yeah, and, this, and then the result is just enhanced representation of the whole sequence. Um, yeah, there are, we have some examples here. So if we need to read this kind of uh, sentence and do some classification based on this sentence for some NLP task. For example, when we, the sentence is the FBI is chasing a criminal on the run. So when we're reading, let's say, the last word, the run, we can see that the model is basically looking not only on the previous two words, but it also pays attention to this second word. So it learns to basically look further, right? Not just in the previous one word, but it can look further than that. Um, and that's because uh, this blue color, you can see it as importance weight. So when I, when I want to understand what run means in this sentence, I need to look also in this word. So it's important, it has high importance, when learning this word run. Uh, so until now I was talking mostly about uh, sentences and translation and NLP problems, but uh, that's because attention was firstly introduced in the NLP community, but it's actually a really general concept, so it's not really just related to NLP stuff. It, can, it works very well also in vision and also for multimodal tasks. Um, and yeah, so it basically it's inspired by the success in NLP, but also it's applied to many, many other tasks. Yes? Yeah, so I have more examples also afterwards. You will see what I mean. But basically for now, it's important to know that we have something that is uh, inter-attention. So that's the attention that I was explaining until now, like between the encoder and decoder. And we also have something that is intra-attention, so attention within the encoder. So something like this. So now here, we don't have a translation or something like that. We are not decoding anything. But we need still to learn the word embeddings or the representations of each of those words. And if I want to, yeah. No, that's basically, that's it. Yeah, so if I want to learn, let's say, the word embedding of run, so what does it mean in the context of this sentence? I should also look at this word, right? So I should take this word into account. I should pay attention to this word, FBI, in this case, yeah. Um, in this example, will it always um, pay attention to the, for example, the second word? Or it, that's something that is learned, so we don't know. No, okay. it, it's learned. So if, you, if we go a bit back, yeah, so you see, this is, um, this alpha, so those weights are learned. So basically it's an alignment model which is a fit forward neural net. So it has parameters, weights and biases, and those are learned. Those are jointly trained with the whole encoder decoder model. Yeah. So you learn those on the training set and then apply them obviously on the test set. Yeah. So is this weight always fixed by the position of the word or is the weight always fixed or is it dependent on the word? So if it sees FBI, it's more likely to take it into account. Was it because FBI is on second position? Um, yeah, it doesn't the position doesn't matter that much. It's the meaning of the word. Yeah, it looks at the context, so the context matters, like the surrounding words and all those things, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, that's a, that's a sequence of yeah, elements, yeah. like those are the words. Yeah, so in this case, yeah. uh, or I guess in general, would the maximum sequence be, uh, like would, they, would it have a maximum, se maximum sequence like that? It depends on the model that you're using. Usually in transformers, we have a fixed context window that the transformer can handle. So yeah, it's actually, it's not infinite. Yeah, there is a, it's bounded number. Okay. Do we have more questions, maybe? Yeah. In the self-attention slide, mm -hmm. uh, we saw that a word is only relates to the word that we have seen previously. Mm -hmm. uh, does it always happen? Uh, does it always happen like that, or can it also have relationships with the words happening after? Yeah. So there is not uh, like definite answer to that is because this is learned. So it really depends on the words, it depends on the meaning. So right now for this sentence, yeah, it pays attention to the words before. That's you, almost always the case because the words before the word usually are always important, right? To understand the meaning. But a lot of the time, like a lot of times you need to also look a bit further. So for example, if this was it, like, um, I don't know, I saw a dog and it was running. So that it, what does it mean? To what is it related, right? Then the model will look further, for example, to search for the word dog. So it knows that this it refers to this dog or something like that. Yeah, but that depends on the sentence and the model. And the, there's not like a, uh, it's not a rule set in stone. Okay. Okay, so I mentioned that we that attention is really a general concept, so it's not just for, for language tasks. Um, so it's also also used in vision tasks. And an interesting example is image captioning, which mean, which is basically you have uh, images now as input, <laughs> and you need to learn how to describe them. So if we take a look at this example, this is the image. The description is a woman is throwing a frisbee in a park. So when generating this word frisbee. Uh, so now the attention, so, uh, the, the attention weights are over the image. You can see that this shaded white area is basically concentrated around the frisbee. So this is really, really good because this also helps us to have more interpretable models. So we can tell the people, okay, look, when you're generating this word frisbee, the model indeed is aware that this is a frisbee and this is like a more shaded area compared to the rest of the image. Okay, now comes the interesting part. So attention is all you need. Maybe some of you have heard this phrase. This is basically the title of the paper that introduces Transformer. And I think it's maybe one of the most important papers in the last five years. Um, so Transformer is again encoder-decoder model. So same as the ones which we saw previously. But now this model is entirely based on attention and self-attention mechanisms. So we don't have recurrence, we don't have convolutions here. So it's really entirely based on stacks of attention and self-attention layers. Uh, Transformer is basically referred to as NLP image net moment. So it completely changed the landscape of deep learning. Uh, it's state of the art in NLP on all tasks and recently also in computer vision. So we will learn about Transformer through a few important concepts. First, we will look at queries, keys, and values, and what do they mean in a transformer. Then how that leads to scale dot uh, product attention, and how can we build multi-head attention or multi-head sales attention by using this scale dot product uh, attention. Okay, let's look at the first concept of queries, keys, and values. Um, so basically the transformer paper redefined the attention mechanism. So those formulas that I was showing you before, um, they, it's still the same mechanism, but now it's redefined by using the notion of queries, keys, and values. Um, yeah, let's see what's the intuition. Uh, I think the, they got inspired from databases when they were choosing these notions like queries, keys, and values. Uh, so. Um, if we, we can uh, imagine that we use the target sentence as a query, and then the input will be ref a sentence will be referred as a key. 
and then we're using them to calculate a matching score. And then this matching score acts as a weight, so again, it's a weighting mechanism, of the input, which is, named, which is termed as a value vector. So maybe we can understand that better with the figure. So these queries, keys, and values are basically, um, we use linear modules, like linear layers for forward neural networks, which are multiplied with the representation of the input. Uh, this is an example of self-attention here, because uh, it, as I said, self-attention operates uh, within the encoder, so on the one sentence, right? So that's why that sentence X is basically used uh, for the queries, the keys, and the values. And then, how do, what, is, what happens with the formula of attention? So basically, we have the query here, which is multiplied with the key transposed. This is the dot, dot product, so just multiplication. That is scaled with some uh, scalar. And then uh, that's used, uh, that, that's taken as input into a softmax function. And basically, this softmax is producing the weights, the prob like probability, what is more important, what is not, in this value vector. So you see all these queries, keys, and values, they originate from the input, right? These are the tokens. Um, but then when you multiply the queries and the keys, you're getting the matching score uh, with the softmax as well. And then that's multiplied with the value. Like you're putting weights now on the values. So these values here, this V, it's, let's say, imagine like the whole sentence, like just we to the end. So this is the value. And we have some weights now, which are computed by this part. And we're multiplying these weights with the sentence. And then we know which word is more important, what, which word is less important, when we, are generate, when we are generating the translation of some of the words in the input. Um, so, I mentioned that we have a dot product, so hence the name scaled dot product attention. Um, again, this is the formula. So as you can see, attention is now redefined really as simple matrix multiplication. This is a really nice figure, it's from the paper. So you can see here what is happening. So we have the queries, the keys, which are multiplied, then they're scaled, I will tell you why. Uh, we have optional masking here, which I will tell you later why. Then that goes as input in the softmax, so now we have the weights, and those weights are again multiplied with the values, so I have not matrix multiplication, to basically compute the, the final representation. About the scaling, so um, basically these uh, learnable layers here, which are used to kind of transform the input, they have uh, some dimension, let's say dk, which is uh, for longer inputs, it will be large, right? So this dot product here will basically grow very large in magnitude as dk uh, increases, right? So that will push the softmax into regions where uh, there are extremely small gradients, hence the vanishing gradient problem. So that's why they just simply uh, scale this uh, dot product with the dimension itself, and that's why we have scaled dot product attention here. And then that leads us to the multi-head attention. So multi-head attention is also really, it's a simple concept. So instead of performing a single attention function, so what we saw here, it's a single function, right? So instead of performing just a single function, um, they realized it's beneficial if we linearly project the queries, keys, and values h times, each time with a different linear layer. Basically, maybe here you can see in this figure, so now we still have the values, the keys and the queries, but they're projected with h different layers. This here, h. Um, and then we have, instead of one uh, function, one head, we have h heads, that's how it's called. We concatenate all those heads, like in one large representation, which is again linearly projected here with this w layer, and that's the multi-head attention. So basically, again, attention, but with projected versions of the queries, keys, and values. So this is what I just said. 
And basically the idea, like the benefit of this, is that we want to inc increase the learning capacity of the model. So instead of having just one head, which will search for important positions, suddenly we have eight such heads, which in parallel, so that's very important, in parallel, uh, search important positions. So this parallelism is really important property of transformers and that doesn't happen in RNNs. So RNNs process information sequentially. So that's also one of the problems and something that trans transformers are basically solving with this parallel processing. Uh, yeah, so this was the multi-head attention. Of course, we have multi-head self-attention, which is, uh, as I said, basically now the queries, keys and values are equal to the input representation. Or to the previous, or to the outputs of the previous layers, if we are in the in between the stacks of layers. Uh, this is a really nice illustration um, that really visually shows what happens in how do we compute multi-head self-attention. It is from this uh, article, so you have the link here. I really recommend that you take a look at this article. It really it's nice and it it explains things in a visual manner. So. Um, once again, what happens here? Um, we have some input. So this is for self-attention example. So we have some input sentence, right? We embed each word. We have X. And then we split this into eight heads. So it usually um, the number of heads that I showed you on the previous slide, this H, that's a hyperparameter. So it's usually manually chosen. Um, for the transformer, it's eight. So they, uh, what happens? We have eight such uh, projection layers. And then we multiply X or R. Here R is uh, because this also happens at the beginning of the input, but also in between each layer. Um, so we have eight such heads. We multiply X with all those weight matrices. Uh, we calculate the attention uh, using those matrices, as I showed you, basically as shown here. So this is the equation, the softmax, uh, the scale dot product. So we, uh, we compute uh, attention. Basically, this is it, like some representation. So we have eight such representations, which are concatenated here. They're projected, again, uh, with another weight matrix, WO, to produce the output of the layer. So that's it. You are using eight heads, multiplying your input with each of those, and then Stacking everything, concatenating, projecting to a different with a different linear layer to get the final output. Um, okay, so one, now we saw the building blocks: the queries, keys, values, the scale dot product attention, and the multi-head uh, version. So now we can start actually building and assembling our encoder and decoder. So this is how the encoder looks like. Um, basically, in the original transformer, we have six in, uh, layers in the encoder, and this is how one layer looks like. Uh, each layer has two sub-layers. So the multi-head attention, which we were discussing until now, and then a fully connected feedforward network. Um, and then that's one layer, and then it's followed by five more. So it's like stacking multiple layers, and then you have the encoder. Uh, which is something interesting that uh, each sub-layer basically has a residual connection here, as you can see, which is followed by a layer normalization. So these kind of tricks, like residual connections, layer normalizations, maybe you already learned, those are used to basically have more stable training, to have a better performance in the end. So it's like a design choice of the model. And then we have the decoder. Uh, again, it has six layers, and it's uh, and one layer in the decoder is pretty much identical to the encoder layer, with just one more uh, sub layer, and that's basically this sub layer, which performs attention with respect to the uh, output of the encoder. So, as you remember, maybe from the previous slides, in the encoder decoder structure, we have the decoder is basically accessing the encoded states of the encoder, right? So this part, this additional sub-layer is basically doing that. It looks at what the encoder produced. Um, and also one more important concept here is the masked self-attention sub-layer. So as you can see here, we have masked self-attention. 
So basically, uh, the idea of this is we want to prevent the decoder from looking uh, at positions which are still not generated. So we want to prevent the decoder to look in the future, sort of. Uh, we can see that here with this illustration. So if it's just, just attention, just self-attention, then if we're at this position of the input, the model can look at all other positions of the sequence, right? But if it's masked self-attention, basically we're masking this part of the uh, sequence and we're telling the model, we don't want you to look at this part because there is some future information here that we don't want you to know. So if you do generation of text, then you don't want to know what is the ground truth, um, uh, uh, what are the ground truth words uh, like after what you're currently generating. So you don't want to look further from your current time step. And basically that's what is achieved with this masked uh, multi head attention here. That's just in the decoder. So basically, now we have the full transformer here. As you can see, so this is the encoder part, and it's connected here with these arrows to the decoder. And again, this is the paper, very interesting paper, very popular paper, so if you have time, just I would really recommend that you take a look at it. Okay, now let's see how we can code a transformer in PyTorch. So it's very simple, you're going to also do that in the I think in the assignment. Um, so all these things I was taking, talking about, like the number of heads, the dimension of the model, the number of layers, the dimension of the feedforward neural network, those are all hyperparameters that are basically part of the init function of the transformer. The transformer inherits, of course, from nm.module. And then, uh, basically everything that I described until now, like how do we build these layers, how do we connect the encoder and decoder is also reflected in the code. So we have, we define an encoder layer like this. So this is basically already implemented in PyTorch using these hyperparameters as input. And also we define the layer normalization layer, uh, which I told you. And the same for the decoder. So we have a decoder layer uh, and layer normalization layer. Basically, inside these blocks of transformer encoder layer and decoder layer, we have attention, basically, and that's it. And then we define the encoder block, which takes the layer as input with this hyperparameter, which tells how many layers do we want to have. So basically, inside what we have is a loop, which generates, let's say, six of these encoder layers, and it stacks them one after the other. And the same happens um, with the decoder. So similar uh, structure, right? So we have the decoder layer as input and then how many decoder layers we want. And then we have the forward pass, which is pretty simple. So we take the source sentence, which is the input to the encoder, and the target sequence, which is for the decoder, and then optional masking. So this is the masking mechanism that I told you about. And then it's just these three lines, like the encoder, which we defined previously here, takes the source sentence as input, optionally the mask as well, to generate this memory variable, which is used as input in the decoder, together, together with what we want to generate as a target, and it produces basically the output. So it's like you're wiring basically components of, and uh, the component of encoder with the component of the decoder. Um, there's one more detail that it's nice to know about transformers, which is pretty important. So, as I said, attention is really a general uh, mechanism, right? So it doesn't really have to do anything just with language tasks. So basically, it's a permutation invariant operation. What does it mean? That uh, attention mechanism as a module, it will return the same output regardless of the order of the input. And this is not really good for NLP tasks, right? As I said, Transformer was first introduced for NLP, so we have their text. And the order of the words really matters, right? Because if it's like just a bunch of unordered words, then the sentence doesn't have a meaning. So the authors realized that the order matters here in this um, <coughs> Transformer model. So how to preserve the order, basically? That's the, the problem here. Well, we have these positional encodings. Um, which are just, uh, it's very simple. They're just added to the input 
sentences or the outputs to make sure that the order will be taken into account, the order of the words. And those are these blocks here. So we can see they're literally added. So like we have the plus here, so like a summation operation. So something like this, we have the input, again, just to the end. Uh, every word is represented with an embedding, as you can see here. And then this positional encoding is just some other representation, which is added here, it's summed, with the word embeddings, and that's it. So the intuition behind this is that this positional encodings basically follow some pattern in the, in the sequence that the model learns, because um, this is jointly uh, trained, right? So this is added here, and then the training starts. Um, so the idea is to determine the position of the word, the distance between the words, the sequence, so to make the model aware of the order of the words. And they can encode spatial, temporal, or modality identity. They can be learned or fixed. Um, this is also, there's also one more detail, so how the original transformer defines these positional encodings, because there, there's not just one way how you define these positional encodings. There are like a few options, as I said, they can be learned, fixed. So basically the transformer is using sine and cosine functions of different frequencies of words, defined here with these um, equations here, uh, basically, and the output uh, is some representation like this, which is then summed with the word embedding. So then this summation here uh, goes here, right? So that's how we, uh, that's how the encoder receives the the input and then starts processing with uh, this multi-head attention layers and feed forward layers and so on. Okay. Uh, okay, so now let's also briefly see the pros and cons of a transformer. So I mentioned this parallel, uh, parallel property. So now transformer, the transformer model can basically operate on data in parallel, which really makes the learning process uh, faster compared to RNNs. So RNNs or LSTMs, they process data sequentially, right? So word by word. But transformer basically is doing that in parallel, right? We're, we, show, we saw like the figure where it basically can observe words in parallel, right? Not just the previous word sequentially, but also words before. And can deal with long-term dependencies because of this property of the attention. But there are also some problems. They are pretty much complex, so it scales quadratically with the number of inputs. So uh, maybe I can go back to one figure to show you what this means. So you can see this matrix here, right? So this is uh, it's pretty large one, right? For just this sentence, which is short. And imagine if you have two sentences or a whole paragraph, then this matrix will be huge, right? So that's a problem. It's, uh, it's making the model really more uh, complex. <clears throat> And they're memory intense as well and require a lot of data and training. Biases? So, for, I think there's still like areas where, for example, convolutional neural networks are uh, are better uh, than transformers. Mm -hmm. And obviously, like they have like this um, this strong bias to, to search for specific features. Um, mm -hmm. But in, in more general data structures, there would obviously also be other biases of even prior knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so, the question is basically. Do transformers um, scale endlessly? Is that the best that we can do? Or sort of what other problems are there? 
So with respect with uh, the, <coughs> the first uh, bullet point, the quadratic complexity, uh, this is for the original transformer paper. So <coughs> now there are new better models, of course, which are basically kind of solving this issue. I think you will actually see one of those models towards the end of the lecture. So it's really a design choice. How do you design your mechanism? You can make part of it to be learnable, which will basically solve this quadratic complexity. And then for the bias, that usually comes from the data. So these data sets that are used to train transformers usually are very huge, collected from the web, and they contain everything. So a lot of bias is already in the data, and basically the transformer is using the is learning the bias, like gender bias or yeah, yeah, yeah all those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you mean biases from the data or architectural biases or? Yeah, architectural biases. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think you will talk about that more in the VAT part, right? Yeah, with respect to the convolution networks. Uh, okay. Yeah, so we're almost to the end. Let's uh, summarize like what we're talking about about until now. So um, we started from encoder-decoder architecture as a useful one for many deep learning problems. Uh, we took machine translation like, as an example, and uh, we described what is the issue that this encoder-decoder model has. So it's with the fixed size of the context vector. And then attention basically overcomes this problem by learning to select important features instead of compressing everything into one fixed uh, size vector. And then transformer is basically the first model that entirely relies on attention without any recurrence for NLP tasks or without any convolutions for computer vision tasks. Um, and is basically state of the art in NLP and also recently in computer vision. We also have some recommended papers which I mentioned throughout the talk. So I would recommend the first one, so machine um, neural machine translation by learning to align and translate, which is where attention is trans uh, introduced. And also the last one, attention is all you need, where, we, uh, where they introduce the transformer. Okay, so that's it for this part. We can maybe take a short break, or maybe first if you have any comments or questions. Um, okay, <laughs> thank you. This slide up with a survey. Ah, okay. Yeah, I'm new to these things. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to cough and I was like, if I start Yeah, so that's this one. This one mutes it. Uh,
Hi. Now it works, right? Yeah. Sorry? I cannot hear you. Of the weather? Wait. No. Okay, maybe we can start. Should, should we start? What? I don't want to talk about that. Everyone? Hi. Let's continue. Let's continue. Okay. So, in the second part of the lecture, we're going to talk about different transformer models. Um, so, this is the overview of the lecture. First, I will talk about language transformers. So, the two, probably the most famous ones, BERT and GPT. Then a bit about multimodal transformers, basically uh, when vision comes in, so vision and language transformers, uh, such as CLIP and Flamingo. And then uh, we'll talk about the vision transformer and finally the perceiver as a more general uh, transformer architecture. So let's start with the language part. Um, so one of the probably the largest breakthrough uh, in NLP with transformers was done by BERT. Have you, do you know about BERT? Have you heard about BERT? Probably you did, yeah, it's really, it's a really popular model. Uh, what does it stand for? So it's a bidirectional encoder representations from transformers. So the first letters of this phrase, so BERT. So BERT is a pre-trained transformer encoder. So if you remember the whole structure that we saw of the transformer, so this is just the encoder part. Um, we have to, um, should, should we wait like for, ah, okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so uh, BERT is how, like what's the idea? So first we have two stages in this large scale uh, models, like first pre-training them, which is usually done <coughs> in a semi-supervised or unsupervised manner uh, on large amounts of data. And then the second stage is usually when we have the downstream tasks, so that's the supervised training uh, on, with a labeled data set. Um, okay, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, so uh, once we pre-train a model like BERT, it can be fine-tuned just with very small architectural changes in the output layers. And BERT basically achieved state-of-the-art for many, many NLP tasks. So how do we represent uh, the inputs for this kind of models, like BERT? Um, so this figure shows us what happens. So first we have, so uh, we work with text, right? So we have the token embeddings. So basically the sentence is uh, tokenized. We have now tokens, each one represented with an embedding. Uh, we have a segment embeddings. Okay, this, um, <laughs> it's a bit, you know. <laughs> Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, I was just. <laughs> yeah, I don't, cannot speak like this. I cannot hear you. Is there a difference between bidirectional and uh, transformer? There is a difference. I mean, I, I will tell you. Yeah, we'll see about it. Um, okay, let's continue. So for the, those who arrived late, we are now talking about different transformer models. First, we started with language uh, transformers, uh, basically with BERT. So bidirectional encoder representations from transformers. It is bidirectional because it's 
pre-trained, so in the pre-training phase, is basically jointly conditioning on both the left and the right context. So basically it observes the sentence from both sides, not just from left to right, but also from right to left. And that's, that helps the model to learn better contextualized uh, representations, as we will see in the next slides. So uh, here we are talking about the input representations, how the input in this model looks like. Um, so it's pretty flexible because it, we can have one sentence, but uh, also a pair of sentences. And I was talking about what the segment embeddings mean here. So basically they uh, denote which part of the full input is related to the first sentence and which part is related to the second sentence. So if we have sentences A and B, then this part here, like this, my dog is cute, is the first sentence and he likes playing is the second sentence. And then if we have two sentences, we have uh, something that is called a separation token, like to separate the two sentences. Also, uh, what is really important, not just for the bird input representation, but also later for the vision transformer, is basically uh, the leading token of this input uh, sequence. So the leading token is the classification token. So um, the hidden state of this token, so you can think about it as that's a part of the words here, but basically what it does in BERT, it's aggregating the whole sequence representation in this token. And then this is really helpful for downstream classification tasks, because then the classification basically depends on this special classification token. I mean, classification, for example, is the text, I don't know, spam or not spam? So like really classification of texts. Um, Okay, so this is the input representation that we saw here. Now let's see the pre-training of this kind of models. So uh, specifically for BERT, there are two pre-training tasks. Um, so the first task is basically mask language modeling. So this is a really simple task. Basically, they mask a percentage of the sentences with this special token mask, and then they train the model to predict that masked token. And the second task, is when we have the two sentences, basically predicting the next uh, sentence pre uh, in the array. Uh, that's a binary prediction, so predicting whether the next sec sentence is the correct one. Um, and then these two tasks are used for pre-training uh, the model, and they use huge data sets. So, like the book corpus, which has 800 millions of words, and basically Wikipedia, so those are huge data sets. But um, that's like one of the key elements for the success of large-scale transformers, so using really huge data sets. And this kind of large-scale pre-training is not really feasible uh, to do like with our own computers, let's say. Um, and then we have the fine-tuning stage, which is the second stage. So we have nicely pre-trained the model on these two tasks, and now we have the fine-tuning. So fine-tuning really depends on your downstream task. It can be classification of sentences, it can be question answering or single sentence tagging, so it really depends on, on your task. And of course, fine tuning is really way less expensive compared to pre training, and that's usually how we use these models. So, we already use pre trained models, They're, most of them are available, uh, the pre trained weights, and we use them for some downstream tasks. An interesting property of BERT is uh, like how does it work with word embeddings. So if you know word to vector glove, um, basically they produce word embeddings uh, representing words. And they capture semantic relationship in the words. But the problem is that they will always produce the same representation, the same vector uh, for the word independent of the context. And that's actually very bad because we can take a look at this example. Um, so we have two sentences. Uh, we went to the river bank, and the second sentence is, I need, to go, uh, I need to go to bank to make a deposit. So if you ask models like word to vec or glove to give you the word embedding for a bank, they will give you the same representation in both sentences. But if you ask BERT to do that, it will give you different representations. Because BERT can create actually contextualized word embeddings. So basically BERT is trained to take a look at the context. So if you remember what attention was doing, 
like it was relating different positions with the current word, right? The self-attention mechanism. And that's why birds, models like birds, are aware of the context surrounding a given word when they're producing these word embeddings, right? Because the meaning of this word bank in this sentence should be really different from the meaning of bank in this sentence. And basically, BERT achieves that. And that's why it's really state-of-the-art in many NLP tasks, because it has this ability. This is the first model that can do this, basically. Um, next, we have GPT family of models. So GPT uh, by OpenAI, it stands for Generative Pre-Training by Transformers. It's different from BERT because this is basically the decoder part of the transformer. So again, if you remember the whole transformer structure, we have encoder-decoder. BERT was the encoder part, like encoding words, but GPT is the decoder part. So basically, what GPT does is generation of text. So BERT cannot do that. Um, so they have basically different purpose. So you, we cannot say that one is better than the other, they're just different. The, the goals of both of them are different. Um, so again, we have the concept of pre-training and then fine-tuning on specific downstream tasks. Uh, we have unsupervised pre-training in GPT, so basically uh, using the standard language modeling objective of predicting the next word given the previous uh, tokens. And supervised fine-tuning depending on the task that you have in mind. Until now, OpenAI released three versions of GPT. So they started with GPT-1, um, then GPT-2. So basically the difference in all these models is that each time, we can maybe look at this table, each time they make the model larger and larger and they use more and more data to train the model. So that's like basically one of the rules for transformers. Like if you build them with more uh, layers and if you give them more data, then the performers always, performance goes always up. So it's interesting to see this uh, role. So they started with 117 million parameter model. And then GPT-3 has 175 but billion parameters. So that's like huge difference and of course the the performance uh, goes up as well. So now GPT-3 is the latest model, and it can really generate text. Uh, something, for example, it can write SQL for you, it can write code, it can write essays, it can write like basically anything. And um, it only needs a description of the task. So you need to just type like a sentence, what do you want the model to achieve, and it will start generating something about what you used as a prompt. So it's really impressive. And also these are the papers that are introducing all GPTs. So I also wanted briefly to talk about the difference between these models, like GPT versus BERT. Um, so, as I said, the key difference is that GPT is a transformer decoder and BERT is a bidirectional encoder. GPT outputs tokens one at a time, so decoding procedure. Um, so, producing one token and adding it to the sequence of inputs, like basically text generation. And this idea is called autoregression, so it's a uh, small detail. BERT doesn't have this autoregression. Uh, but by losing that, it gains the ability to incorporate context because it can observe what happens on both sides of the world. So that's why I said, depending on your uh, goal, on the task, you can choose GPT or BERT, so they have different, uh, different goals in mind, as we can also see here in this figure. So BERT basically can observe the whole uh, sentence and GPT is generating text, and that's why they cannot see what is after the word that we're currently generating. Okay, so next um, we're going on the multimodal side now. So we are including vision. Um, this is a really interesting model called CLIP. Um, yeah. GPT is by OpenAI. We can talk about it later, maybe after class, because we don't have much time until I 
yeah. Um, okay, so CLIP. Um, CLIP was basically introduced last year and it really make a huge boom in multimodal learning, also in vision. Uh, it stands for Contrastive Language Image Pre-Training. I think so in the second assignment you're working with CLIP. Um, and it's a, it has a really simple architecture. So we have an image encoder, which can be a CNN or it can be a vision transformer. And then we have a text encoder, which acts, uh, which is a transformer, something like BERT. And what happens, uh, now we have images, so we have pairs of images and captions. Clip processes the image with image encoder and generating an embedding. And it does the same for the text. So maybe we can look at this figure too, so it can become more clear. So we have a bunch of images, uh, they're encoded with the image encoder, and we have these embeddings like I1, I2, and so on. And the same happens with the text. So we have T1 as a representation of the first sentence, T2 as a representation of the second sentence, and so on. Then uh, the pre-training uh, of CLIP is basically really simple. So it aims to predict which text as a whole, so as a whole embedding here, is paired with which image. Um, and we use the dot product to do that. So basically the overall idea is to maximize the similarity of the same image and text uh, pairs and to um, minimize the similarity of incorrect pairs. So this idea is basically uh, something which is called contrastive loss optimization, which you will talk about in the later uh, lectures, I think. Um, so that's it. This is how CLIP is pre-trained. Basically to predict which text as a whole is paired with which image. And you can see here, uh, yeah, so basically we want to push these pairs closely in the latent space and we want to push the rest of them, which are incorrect, more far away, right from each other. And then what happens at inference time? Well, at inference time, CLIP becomes a zero-shot learner. So that's an amazing, uh, really impressive capability. So basically, it can do zero-shot classification. That means it can predict labels of images which were never observed during training. And how does it do that? So, it uses, so basically, it uses something that is called prompts. So this is an example of a prompt. We have a photo of A and then a placeholder for the label of the image. Um, so how the interest time, what happens? So we have all the possible labels for a given image. And basically we construct sentences like this, like a photo of a plane, a photo of a car, a photo of a dog, a photo of a bird. So those are all different options, right? All different captions. We encode them with the text encoder, which gives us all these different representations. Then we also encode the image and we compute uh, the similarity between all these sentences and the image. Um, of course, then that's normalized into a probability distribution because we have a softmax afterwards, and that gives the most probable pair. So if you find the most probable pair, that means that you're fine, you found the, the class, right? So this is a photo of a dog because the most similar pair of image and text was this one, the third one, T3, which was basically the class of a dog. And this is how zero-shot classification works in CLIP. Here we have some examples. Um, so as I said, you can, you can see that CLIP was pre-trained to, do, uh, to uh, find the similarity of images and text, right? So basically you can do something like this. This is the image. So we have five sentences something like a photo of guacamole, a type of food, or a photo of a hummus. And then the first sentence is the closest sentence as a whole to the representation of this image. And then the prediction is guacamole, like as a label of the image, as you can see here. Um, then it's another interesting property of CLIP, it's uh, the robustness that it has. Um, so uh, they found that zero-shot clip models are basically much more robust than the equivalent ImageNet models, like 
pre-trained in a supervised manner. And this tells us that this zero-shot evaluation that I explained to you, it's a really better representative of what the model is capable of. Um, so we can look at this example um, with the bananas. So ImageNet has this kind of images with some bananas, right? And then the accuracy of a ResNet is pretty close to clip. But then if we go to other domains, for example, if we have a sketch like this here, then you can see that the performance really increases. Just, sorry. <coughs> sorry. Um, sorry? Okay, and then um, one more impressive thing about CLIP is that they achieve pretty much state-of-the-art over 27 data sets, uh, which shows that this zero-shot transfer that they have is pretty much impressive, right? Um, so it's surprising that a model which performs well on these images fails on Im if the image is a sketch or something like that. But this is called something like uh, this distribution shift. And it really, it's a challenge to solve. So CLIP, as I said, is pretty much popular. So it's already used in many other models. If you're familiar with DALI 2, that's basically the very famous image generation model where you use this kind of a caption as input and then suddenly it generates you a really nice image uh, conditioned on the sentence. It's used in video language retrieval, also in semantic segmentation, uh, and so on. But of course, it has shortcomings, right? Uh, so um, CLIP basically provides a similarity score between text and image. And that's like the main characteristic. This means that it's able to tag only limited or predefined set of labels, right? Because it's doing classification. So it lacks the ability to generate language. And that makes it less suitable for open-ended generation tasks. Um, so basically, Clip would just offer some labels of these images, like, I don't know, a cat or elephant. But what if we want to generate description for, this, um, for these images in a zero-shot manner as well? Well, there is also a really recent solution for this in visual language models, such as Flamingo. Uh, this is basically a model from this year. It's by DeepMind. And it's pretty much impressive. So it's, again, completely based on a transformer. And it's able to do multimodal future learning uh, with different tasks, like captioning, visual dialogue, visual question answering. So the task is basically not that much important. And it's able to do this only by observing few input-output examples. So it's able to operate in few shot settings. And this is the impressive part. So if you use just two examples like this, an image and the corresponding text, and then you use this as a query image with the beginning of a sentence saying this is a, the model takes this as the input, and it can infer that your task is basically to describe this image, and it will complete by generating that it's a flamingo, and then other details. Um, so it open, operates in an open-ended manner, which is similar to GPT. So you can see there is like connection between what I was talking about GPT, but now this is GPT able to process also images. So it's really impressive. And this, what this shows is that really Transformer is a general architecture. So it doesn't matter if you have images or text, it can still learn to process the data uh, pretty much uh, with a very good performance. So let's just see how the model looks like. On the vision side of the Flamingo, we have uh, text encoders like Clip. On the language side, we have uh, GPT-like models, like ultra-aggressive language model. And those two structures, so the encoder and decoder, are linked via, uh, with a learnable attention component, uh, which is in this code called the perceiver. And basically, the perceiver outputs a fixed size token, so a size set of visual tokens. And those are used as input in the, to the language model 
to complete the generation of the text or the answer of the question, depending on what's the task in mind. We also have some examples here for visual dialogue. So if we use this kind of image as input to the model and we ask, what is this picture? Then Flamingo says, it's a bowl of soup with a monster face on it. And then we, as users, we ask, what is the monster, monster made out of? And Flamingo says, it's made out of vegetables. And we say, no. So we are correcting the model. We say, no, it's made out of kind of fabric. Can't you see what kind? And then Flamingo says, yeah, it's made out of woolen fabric. So it's really being, you know, you can really communicate with this model, right? You can tell him, no, you're wrong. Like, try to think, uh, think once again. So that, that's the impressive part for me, I think. And then I have also some other examples of this visual dialogue. So, yeah, we don't have to go over details. You can maybe look at them in the slides, because I think the next part is the vision transformer. And if you have any questions, let me know. All right, thanks, Ivona. Um, also, just a brief note about the, the breaks. So typically, unless I say otherwise, the breaks are always until zero past. So if we take the break at quarter two, then it's 15 minutes. If we take the break at 10 two, it'll be 10 minutes break. So it's a bit flexible, unless I, I'll, otherwise I'll announce it. Um, so with that, I hope that point is clear. Um, and uh, yeah, in the slides, there will be this point about the feedback. So I ask you to give us feedback because now we're midway um, through the lectures. So we can, we're curious to hear what, what you think. It's not just about the lectures, but also the tutorials and the assessments. Um, we'll show this once later. All right, so now we'll go to the vision transformer, which was basically the model that brought uh, the transformer architecture and the attention to the computer vision community. Um, as Ivona mentioned, the transformer is the standard for NLP, but wasn't that common for, for vision tasks, except for, for example, fusing modalities, but definitely more towards the end. And it really came about uh, one, one and a half years ago that the vision transformer became really big for vision. And the main idea is basically, instead of treating, treating images as they are, we simply treat them as sequences of image <laughs> patches. So then if we just say images are a bunch of image patches, then we can simply uh, use a transformer architecture on this, and we have all the benefits that the transformers have, have been showing us in the NLP domain, like the great scalability, that they, work in, that they work and scale nicely with larger data sets and so on. Um, and we get rid of these convolutional layers, and I'll tell you a bit why that might be a good idea in a bit. Let's first take a look at this uh, groundbreaking paper called the Vision Transformer, that the paper that introduced the vision transformer. And with this one, I'll also try to explain you how to understand a figure one, so-called, because quite often these papers, and I hope you're reading more and more papers, or at least have, have the plan to read more and more papers, they always have a figure one, typically, and this figure one explains exactly what is happening. So here, there's two things happening. There's this clear dotted line, so you would typically start at the left-hand side, right? So you can see an image, and you can see this idea of, okay, this thing is divided into different patches. It's probably not three by three patches, because it's just a figure to illustrate it. Um, but okay, so you have here patches, and then you can see these are lined up nicely. Then you can see they are processed by a linear projection, okay? And then you have these, they get turned into some sort of vector, and then you have these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you can see, okay, this is a positional embedding. Okay, so this then tells me that the first patch comes from the top left corner, the last patch comes from the bottom right corner. Okay, so we have some sort of spatial information coming here. Um, what you can also see here is that the linear projection is sort of, you can see it's the same across all of these. So what this means is um, you have one projection layer which operates on all of these, so that's kind of like a convolution, actually. And after that, you simply have the transformer encoder where everything gets in, 
but the output only comes from this um, extra learnable class embedding, which is this CLS token, which we'll go to in a bit. And then the output simply gets post-processed by an MLP, which then outputs a class probability. So that's, that's pretty much how the broad architecture looks like. Um, and the inside of the transformer encoder is then shown on the right part of the figure. So you can see this L times part, which simply means repeat this for L uh, layers. Um, and you can see the typical multi-head attention. Um, you can see the residual connections that we've had uh, last lecture. You can see the norms, which in this case are layer norm layers. Um, and this is pretty much it. So this, as simple as it gets, this is the structure. Um, for here, I want to take a quick uh, pause for you. So from what you've learned about intention, I want you to think about what could be a potential advantage of using intention compared to convolutions when you're operating on images. So please discuss with your neighbors, take two minutes and uh, yeah. All right, let's continue. So let's see how many of your points will be, will be mentioned in the, last, in the next couple of slides. And if you're unsure about points, we can discuss them after these slides, and uh, let's see. All right, so first of all, talking about this vision transform a bit more. So like the BERT, uh, BERT model, there's this CLS or class token, which gets used to do classification. Um, as a matter of fact, you could, also you could also leave this one out and simply average pool all the tokens that you get at the end and then have an MLP head. And this has been done um, afterwards as well. Um, in addition, we have these positional encodings, uh, which I've mentioned. And these are simply vectors which are learned. So they're not, they could be uh, fixed, but in, as a matter of fact, in vision transformers, these are often simply vectors that get learned to be added to the Pratt projection layer. So these are simply learned, and they learn, in fact, this positional, uh, this position inf information. Um, so basically, these two points are shown here. So if we want to use a CLS token, it simply gets concatenated to the current input, which is reshaped to some, some degree, never mind that part. And then if um, what happens afterwards is we simply add this positional embedding. So obviously the positional embedding at that point has to be the correct size, but it's as simple as that, what, what's happening for this part in the, in the vision transformer. Um, we can take a look at this first uh, projection layer that's uh, shown at the top left. So here, similar to the AlexNet figures, you can see that there's some distinct color blobs or like color contrasts going on. You can see some edge filters. And you can see that here it's written the first 28 principal components, which uh, you could have a think about. The main direction of reasoning is here that instead of having just like an AlexNet 64 filters or something, we have basically uh, 768 um, 
So you would have a lot of redundancy, so that's why you want to reduce and sh simply show the ones which have uh, the most variance between each other. Um, in the middle, you see this position embedding, which uh, has been learned. So you can see that you can project this simply into the 2D space, and you can see um, that each positional embedding basically encodes the location. So you could have done that manually, but by learning it, you you allow the data to speak a bit more for itself. Now, the right plot is, is probably the most in interesting one. What you can see here is where each patch is looking at. So if, for example, you're at the very top of this on the y-axis, it means all the patches are looking at stuff that's very far away from each other. And if you're at the bottom, which you are if you're very shallow in the network, it means that the patches, they have a high attention to its neighbors which you can see that for the most part, it's looking at close, uh, close by patches in the, in the shallow parts of the network. And the deeper it goes, the more it looks at the global image, which uh, if you had a convolutional neural network, it would mo more or less look like a linear scale, um, which means that uh, the transformer can be seen as, so the transformer could look at or looks indeed at very local structures, but has the flexibility to already look at the very global structure, or like if you're processing a patch at the bottom left, it could already be looking at the top right, uh, whether, for example, there's a sky or whether there's a room ceiling instead, already at very shallow uh, layers at the network. In fact, you can also write, write this out that the transformer is basically a superset of convolutions. So if you have a, a transformer layer or multi-head self-attention with these specific characteristics, you can actually learn any convolutional layer. Now this is a theoretical result and doesn't quite explain why it works so well, um, but you can think of it as a basically more general convolution because it can look at local stuff, but if the data says basically it's much more advanced it, it has a big advantage by already looking at global structures or structures that are further away, then it can do that. There's some further reading if you want to look at this. There's also something called deformable convolutions, which are quite related to this, but is uh, slightly out of scope for this lecture. Um, one finding was that the original uh, paper found that the vision transformer, the BIT, training that one is quite difficult. So for example, here you can see the BIT baseline, which is simply a, a ResNet uh, model, it performs pretty well at the ImageNet scale, so that's the point furthest on the, on the x-axis on the left. And here the transformer models, which are these circles, they are far behind um, this BIT. However, if you go to larger pre-training data sets like ImageNet or JFT, which is a proprietary data set from Google, you can see that the vision transformer catches up and even surpasses this. So, at low levels or at low lum numbers of uh, ImageNet or F at data sizes, the original VIT didn't perform that well. However, this has been alleviated somewhat, mainly due to additional regularization. So here you can see, uh, for example, dropout, you can see repeated augmentations, you can see mix up, auto augment, exponential moving averages. There's all kinds of regularizations which have been used, which all made basically training a VIT even on this smaller image net viable and competitive. Regarding the features that VIT learns, here for example, just as a, as a comparison, CNNs have this sort of trapezoidal shape if you look at the features. VITs are isotropic, so this means same space. So all the patches, they get processed the same way. So we don't lose any patches. We don't, we, we're not uh, com making the feature map any smaller the deeper we go. Here, for example, we see the attention that the CLS token has with regards to the spatial patches, which makes for nice visualizations. You can also uh, use these for interpretability. And in fact, if you, you can use these spatial patches for all kinds of things. So for example, you can use these for co-segmentation. For example, by using the very deep features, you can simply run principal components on these features, and you can detect that uh, ears, for example, or s similar parts of the object have the, same, um, have the same principal component. And Dino is one of those uh, self-supervised pre-training methods that we are going to talk about, and these things are quite powerful. So you can 
without any supervision have this sort of very coherent segmentation of objects, um, even across changes in viewing angle and so on and so forth, which is uh, quite powerful and resonance weren't able to do that. However, also here note that even if you do not have positional embeddings, so basically what the transformer would be looking at is simply a bag of features, so all of the patches randomly mixed together, they could have been completely shuffled, then it still achieves something like 61% on, uh, on an ImageNet 5-shot task compared to if you add these positional embeddings, you get 64. So that's not a big difference, right? So again, with a somewhat cautious note, again, that ImageNet, you can mostly solve with pretty local structures like textures. Um, so this came out. Afterwards, of course, there has been a ton of improvements. I'm just going to mention a few here. One is the Swin transformer, which basically proposes to, to enforce this local neighborhood structure. So it, it sa basically said, hey, we know from CNNs that actually having this hierarchical structure works quite well, so why don't we put this back into the neural networks and proposes to only look at local neighborhoods. And these local neighborhoods, the deeper you go, gradually become bigger. So at the subfigure F, you end up having this global attention, so every patch can look at everywhere else. But in the more shallower parts, you're only looking at uh, local neighborhoods. Another improvement has been hybrid architectures. So for example, someone ran an experiment like this where they had DIT, which is a transformer, and compared it to resonant training curves. And then what they did is they simply, had, they simply cut, took a resonant and cut off everything after the first resonant stage and added transformer layers. Or they had two stages of ResNet and then added a bunch of transformer layers. And what they figured out is that actually if you have a few convolutional layers, it trains a lot faster compared to the pure vision transformer. So they said basically that's, that's funny, let's propose a new network architecture. And so that's how they arrived at these hybrid architectures. You can see at the bottom that the image comes in and you have this py pyramid, this trapezoid trapezoidal shape, and then after that you end up at a much smaller spatial resolution, which then gets further transformed using a transformer stack. And these are pretty much the best architectures we have at the moment, these hybrid architectures. Right, finally, some, some slightly different type of uh, um, transformer is a perceiver. Um, here the main idea is to not only be able to work at image data, but be, a, be, be able to work on any kind of data. So point clouds, or audio streams, 3D data, all of these things. And that's the main innovation that they have proposed. How, and the, main pro, uh, the main problem that they have with transformers is this, um, <coughs> is this squared complexity of the attention. Right? So if your input's n, are very big and your attention is n by n, so that's n squared, that becomes problematic. That's why they introduced this cross-attention module, um, which basically allows you to reduce this by a lot. Instead of uh, attending n squared, now you have m by n as a, as a complexity, and this m you can choose, basically. And if you choose it small enough, you have reduced the complexity to be even able to process stuff like point clouds, which could be ranging in the millions of inputs. And a attention matrix, which is a million by a million, yeah, that, that typically won't work on any kind of computer. And that's why they've introduced that one. And furthermore, they have this interesting structure of repeatedly looking back at the input. So it's not like the input gets... Uh, for example, linearly projected and then further processed, but instead it gets processed and then there's some processing happening on this upper stream and then it looks again at the input, mixes it with the current information, keeps on going. Um, it isn't anywhere near state of the art at the moment, but it's just a very different architecture which is um, probably quite interesting for some of you. Um, right, so the main thing was, was this uh, about the quadratic self-attention. So the main idea is you introduce this asymmetry in the attention mechanism, uh, which results in this order of mn. All right, so this, is, this was a lot, uh, I know. Um, but uh, we wanted to give you this broad overview. So the transformer is 
so we had a couple of lectures on CNNs and also you had them in computer vision. So this probably, and you will maybe have talked about attention in, in NLP, but the transformer is probably here the only lecture, at least for a bit. And so we wanted to give you this broad overview as well as a, the want you to pay attention to the attention mechanism um, just because it's so generalizable. And in fact, we'll be also seeing a similar one in the next lecture when we talk about graph neural networks. So this is just a very fundamental way to compute stuff and to be more general than convolutions, basically. All right, with that, um, we can, yeah, we can have some questions and otherwise. Yeah, let's have one question here in the open one, yeah. From a very uh, broad, like, um, I guess, research point of view, mm -hmm. so you mentioned uh, these uh, hybrid models right now. Uh, when, when you're coming up with new models, do you just generally put together different things that already exist and see what sticks? Or is there, like, for example, the authors of the, this, this hybrid model, do they have some sort of uh, motivation? Right. So the question is how, how we can come up with new models, whether we just put together components. I mean, I would say from a gut feeling that 90% of the papers or even of the innovations are recombinations of existing things. But sometimes it's not trivial what you combine, right? Like maybe you take one bit which was invented in the 90s, combine it with something that's hot right now um, quite often. It's rare that you would typic that you would completely invent something new, but of course, that also happens. But yeah, mostly it's recombinations. All right, then I would say let's take a 10-minute break before the next thing starts. And if you have questions, please come forward.